matter to come before us this morning is Laura Ticola versus Jill Nidilio. Please, please help me if I'm not. Um, I apologize. Let me just say I apologize if I'm not properly um, pronouncing those names. Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you're the appellant and wish to reserve any time, you let me know when you get started. I'm keeping the clock. You can also reference the clock on the wall. Um, but if you let me know, that just helps me um, keep track of time. The arguments are being recorded, so please keep your voice up and remain at the podium. Do not use the names of any victims or minors. We've read the briefs. We're ready to see when you are. Thanks, Your Honor. Thank you. Counsel, would you like to reserve any time for rebuttal? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Can I uh, reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please? Certainly. Your Honor, may it please the court, uh, on behalf of the appellant, uh, Jill Quilio, uh, the administrator of the estate of Everett Plus, deceased, uh, my name is Ian Lucian, uh, and I submit to you that the trial court erred when it ordered uh, her to disclose her deceased father's medical records, which are protected by physician-patient privilege under RC 2317.02b. Um, I'd like to address just two quick preliminary matters before I get to the heart of the matter. Uh, the first one is that um, it's our position that the trial court's error is final and appealable as a provisional remedy under RC 2505.02b, and that is because uh, it orders the disclosure of what we assert to be privileged materials, and this is well established by this court and other courts uh, that um, the, uh, that such an order is final and appealable as a provisional remedy because there's no, um, there, there's no uh, effective remedy that would be available uh, once the disclosure of the records is made. Um, there was an argument in the appellant's, appellee's brief uh, that this might not be final and appealable order because uh, for, for the defense, I did not seek a protective order in the trial court, nor did I request in camera review. Uh, however, there is no authority cited, uh, no authority that I'm aware of that requires uh, it, uh, me to file a protective order in that situation in order for the matter to be appealable or in camera review. Uh, with regard to the protective order, um, the discovery request was made in the trial court. I made the objection at that time uh, that this was uh, protected by physician-patient privilege. Uh, then the motion to compel was filed. The defense opposed the motion to compel, citing physician-patient privilege, and then the trial court um, granted the motion. So there's no reason to think that filing a motion for protective order in addition to the brief in opposition would have made any difference. Um, with regard to the argument about in-camera review, uh, I did not request an in-camera review of these particular records because I do not think that there's uh, any purpose for that here. Uh, in a different situation, uh, we get into in-camera review for medical records, um, and this is mostly for a, in a personal injury case like this, it's usually when the patient is filing the claim, and then there's an issue of discovery of uh, the patient's medical records where there actually is a statutory waiver of the privilege uh, because the patient has filed the medical claim. And then there's a statutory limitation on the waiver and then the court has to look at the records to determine if they fit within the scope of the waiver or not. Here, our position is that, that these records are entirely privileged, and so there would be no purpose for an in-camera review here. They're either privileged or they're not. Um, so uh, the other preliminary issue would be the standard of review, and I would assert to you that the uh, standard of review here is de novo uh, because of the fact that uh, whether, the, whether the privilege statute applies in this case is purely a question of law. Um, so. Uh, I assert that the um, case law establishes that the standard of review is de novo. Uh, so the, the heart of the matter and the main issue in the case is uh, whether Mr. Pleasant's medical records are privileged 
physician-patient communications under RC 2317.02b, and I assert that they are. Uh, under this statute, all such communications, which by definition in the statute, communications include any medical records, including test results, lab results, all that, are all privileged. And the only exceptions to the privilege are ones that are included in the statute. And that would be if the, uh, if the so these uh, records are privileged and not discoverable unless the patient or his administrator or representative consents to the disclosure, which hasn't happened here, or if there's a specific exception in the statute that applies to those records. And here I assert that no exception applies. There's two exceptions in the statute that may uh, be uh, colorable if the facts were similar but different. Uh, and they don't apply here, but I'd like to address them. Uh, the first one would be in a personal injury case where the plaintiff files the case and it's, and it's uh, or, I'm sorry, the patient. The patient makes the claim and it's that patient who's making the claim whose records are in question. And that is, uh, so that would be the exception under subsection B1A Roman numeral 3. But that clearly only applies when the patient is making the claim for injury or files a civil action. So that doesn't apply here. Um, and then there's another exception that was added as an amendment to the statute that does apply to alcohol and drug test results. However, that specifically is limited only to criminal matters. Uh, so that does not apply here in the civil action. So, uh, Your Honors, neither the trial court nor the Ticolas have cited any authority uh, or any rationale for why the privilege statute would not apply to Mr. Plez's records here. Uh, the trial court issued its order with no opinion or explanation as to why the privilege statute wouldn't apply. Uh, the Ticolas have cited two cases that uh, don't actually address the statute. Uh, the first one is Cade versus Lunich, which does not address the issue. And it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm puzzled as to why this case was included in the Ticola's appellate, uh, appellate brief. It was included apparently by mistake in the lower court briefing, but then it was uh, included again in the, uh, in the appellate court brief, and it's clearly an erroneous citation. K versus Lunich did establish that uh, drinking and driving can be a basis for punitive damages in a civil case. However, it doesn't address any of the discovery issues, even though it's cited as addressing them. Um, there's no, and I read this case again this morning just to make sure I wasn't missing something. There's no motion to compel at issue there. There's no medical records at all. In fact, the, the defendant in K versus Lunich actually refused to submit to a blood alcohol test. And that was, uh, you know, that's, that's what was addressed specifically in that case. So there was no, it doesn't even address the privilege issues that, uh, that are uh, at issue here. Um, and then the other, um, the other case then that is cited is Andrews versus Weimer, which is a, an order out of the Summit County Common Police Court that grants a motion to compel for medical records in a similar fact pattern. However, it doesn't address the privilege statute whatsoever. It's not raised at all in the decision, and it's not clear from the written opinion as to whether the parties even raised the issue of privilege in the case. It's completely uh, not addressed. Um, so I submit that the case of Andrews versus Weimer, um, at, also as a trial court decision in Summit County, uh, that would be persuasive authority at best for the trial court judge in Medina County, um, but it also doesn't even address the privilege statute and the issues uh, that we have here. So uh, I assert to you that uh, the, there was binding authority for the trial court in this case. That is the privilege statute and the uh, decision from this case, uh, this court, 
and the U uh, Ohio Supreme Court that I cited in my brief that both uh, that all of these say that these records are not discoverable. And uh, I submit to you that the trial court failed to follow that binding authority and, uh, and erred in ordering the disclosure of uh, these, these re medical records that I assert to you are privileged. And counsel, refresh my recollection. This discovery was propounded according to the court's order in December of 2021. At that time, was the comparative negligence uh, defense or affirmative uh, pending? No, Your Honor. It, it had been waived at that time. Um, this kind of the factual background is that um, motor vehicle accident case. Uh, it, it's one where initially, I, you know, Mr. Plez was killed in the accident. Obviously, I didn't have the opportunity to talk to him about what happened. Um, there was, based on the police report, we thought a colorable um, comparative fault defense. Um, even though it, 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 although it appeared that he uh, failed to yield coming from a stop sign, it also from the police report looked like he crossed, I believe, three lanes of travel and then a center median and possibly a turning lane as well before the impact occurred. So we thought potentially there's a colorable defense here that maybe there's some comparative fault um, that maybe uh, the plaintiff driver could have avoided the accident. Um, we, we waived that defense. Okay, and I, you can proceed or reserve as, as you want, but you have about 4 minutes and 39 seconds left. Okay. If you wanted to initially reserve 5, I'm just letting you know. Understood, Your Honor. Uh, I'll reserve the rest of the time. Sure. Thank you. in this case, Laura Twakawa and her husband, Eric Twakawa. Uh, I appreciate the courts uh, giving me a slight continuance today. I actually was in the 5th District arguing in Tuscarawas County this morning before their court of appeals. Uh, I appreciate the uh, power to get back up here. Um, so uh, I've represented the Twakawa since this accident occurred. There have been multiple issues. Uh, the, the key issue in crux here is what was uh, Mr. Pleasant's blood alcohol level at the time of the accident. In getting there, why it became relevant is when I first took this case, the defense was sudden medical emergency potential. Uh, I was contacted by the uh, representative's carrier who had uh, said that they were reviewing the case for that. And then after that was apparently ruled out, the comparative fault defense came up. And, uh, and that then brings an issue as to Mr. Plez's impairment at the time of the accident. In the that comparative fault defense has now apparently been withdrawn once we asked for the medical records and the disclosure of the alcohol level. But what's a continuing pattern here in this case in the defense is the continued denial of negligence. If you review even the amended answer that removes the comparative fault defense, they deny negligence, a simple negligence counts at 14 different times as we cite the different uh, relevant paragraphs in their answer. They also deny wanton, malice, and reckless driving 14 times, and although they claim that they've admitted liability, I don't see that in the answer. Uh, they claim it, but they don't answer that way. If you also, in review of their uh, appellate brief at page 10, uh, they indicate the following. The police report indicates that 224 is a four-lane highway with a center median and turning lane. It indicates that the Tuacolos were driving in the farthest lane to the south. Therefore, the report indicates that Mr. Plez crossed three lanes of travel, a turning lane, and a center median before reaching the point of impact. Based upon the reported facts, the presence of Mr. Plez's vehicle potentially should have been apparent to Laura Twakla, who was driving their vehicle. Laura had a duty to look and a duty of ordinary care. Isn't this part of what they're saying or admitting negligence, but they're still arguing comparative fault? They're still arguing that Laura Tuacolo apparently driving down 224 on the highway with uh, no traffic control devices in her way that somehow this accident's her fault. They continue to argue it, which means that Mr. Plez's impairment at the time of the accident is certainly relevant. Can yeah, it counsel be relevant and admissible, but not discoverable because of the statute? Well, that raises a real interesting issue. So, 
I guess one of the things we're looking at in the case of discovery is whether or not, not necessarily whether or not the evidence is admissible, but whether or not the evidence is relevant. And that's the way I read discovery. So we argued this uh, at the hearing before Judge Kimbler. I don't know if that record's been filed or if it was ordered by anyone. Um, but there was actually a hearing on this where we discussed that particular issue. And it's my contention that whether it's admissible or not is not really the issue here. This is a discovery issue. Uh, and the question is whether it's relevant. One of the counts of the complaint that we've added uh, in this case is that if a party is under the influence of alcohol at the time of the accident, that you can make a claim under the uh, for a punitive damage element because intoxication is a sign of malicious or reckless conduct in the accident. Had Mr. Plez survived the accident, he died, I believe, nine days after the accident, then he would no doubt would have been uh, charged with a criminal offense. Um, the, the way we obtain the information is that his uh, certificate of death indicated that he died of blunt trauma force to the head, and that is a contributing secondary factor that he died of recent ethanol use as a contributing factor, which is where we got the information, obviously, that he apparently was under the influence or drinking at the time of the accident, so much so that the death certificate actually makes reference to it. But what the plaintiff alleges, does that make what, does that mean that the privilege is waived just because the plaintiff alleged something relevant to this medical document in a civil case? So the question is, is in a civil case, is does he waive his right and privilege to medical records? That's really the issue for the court. Yep. Based on what the, you're saying, based on what we ele we we are alleging, and we're also asking for punitive damages, that means there's a a way to get to these documents that you would otherwise. Be yeah, I mean, I I believe that because the there's a cause of action for uh, intoxication being a, a part of the reckless and malicious conduct of a driver, that that means that his uh, medical records, even if it's just exclusively for that purpose, like I, I have to tell you, and I told the lower court, I'm not interested in obtaining Mr. Pleasant's medical records with regards to his cause of death and, and his treatment that he received over the eight days. What I'm interested to know is what was his blood alcohol level at the time of the accident. And the court did ask me uh, at the hearing whether or not we would accept just that particular issue, uh, and, and, and I'd be fine with that too. It, it can be, that's why we suggested that under a protective order, in-camera inspection, the court could determine what his blood alcohol level was, as long as it's given to me in a form that's, that we can use it uh, and have it be admissible or presented at trial. Thank you. So that, that's really all I have with regards to the response. I think that's the particular issue that's involved in the case. It's pretty narrowly uh, described, and, and uh, with that, we just ask that the lower court's uh, determination be affirmed and that um, the uh, defendants be compelled to produce that information. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel, you have just over four and a half minutes remaining. Um, just, uh, Your Honors, just briefly to address uh, the issue of negligence. Uh, it's going to be uh, accepted at trial. Uh, it's, it was my intention to waive any... I had to file the amended answer. Again, this was done even before plaintiff's deposition. The client, the client driver is deceased, so I, I, mean, I, I really didn't have full information. Uh, however, negligence is going to be stipulated. Uh, but even if it is, um, which it is, um, it doesn't change the privilege statute. It applies regardless. And I would agree that it's not, it's not a relevance, well, it's not a relevance issue. I would agree that the medical records and blood test results would be relevant to a claim for punitive damages, but they're privileged. It's a privilege issue. It's not an admissibility issue. It's a privilege issue. And our position is that there simply is no exception in the privilege statute that would apply in this case. And the case law is clear that courts can't create an exception. And they can't say that, well, we think uh, 
these shouldn't be privileged because of the circumstances of this case. It has to be grounded in the statute, and there was no attempt made by the court, the trial courts, or even um, the appellees to ground a, a to, to, to show an exception to the privilege that applies here because it just doesn't. Um, Uh, Sud medical emergency defense was never asserted in this case. Uh, and yes, of course, we are denying malice. Um, and, and with regard to punitive damages, there is also an issue of whether they are should even be allowed or whether they are even allowed under the law against a dead person. Because uh, obviously he can't be punished. The only purpose for the claim of punitive damages is, is, simply, to, uh, is simply for additional compensation. There's no punishment that's possible here. Uh, Mr. Plez is deceased. But that's a different issue for later. Um, but in this, in this particular case, um, the issue is not whether these records are admissible at trial. It's not even whether they're relevant. I agree, they're relevant to a potential claim for punitive damages. The issue is whether they're privileged. And it's our position that the statute is clear. They are privileged here. And the uh, trial court erred by uh, by ordering the disclosure of the privileged medical records and information and test results. Uh, so we would, I would ask that the uh, trial court's order be reversed specifically as it re uh, relates to, I believe it was request for production of documents number 10 that requests those medical records, um, that this court hold that the that Mr. Pleasant's records are uh, privileged and not discoverable, and then I would request that uh, this court remain the matter back to the trial court for further proceedings consistent with that. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation today. The court will take the matter in advisement. We will issue a decision. We support the court's will mail to all parties in this appeal. It will also be posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website.